This is our second video in a series for uh, uh, early letter forms project. Uh, the previous video we talked about text, placing text, resizing it, working with columns, and uh, other formatting issues, uh, indents and, and the like. Um, let's talk about the headline just for a second. Um, some of you guys might want to be a little bit more creative with the headlines. Now, if I'm using Helvetica New in my body copy, that means if I'm not going to hand generate my typography, then my uh, headline also needs to be Helvetica New. Okay, so whatever font you're using for your body copy needs to be the same font for the headline, and that font needs to be the same on all three of the, of the panels. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make this Helvetica New. And it can be a bold or a light or an italic or a combination. Just make sure I'm using, I have to make sure I'm using the open type. So I'm just going to start with Helvetica Light Roman. Okay. Now, with regard to visual hierarchy, what's the most important word in my headline? It started with an ox. Ox. So I can actually copy and paste this ox into its own text box. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete it, or excuse me, I'm going to hit Command X, which would be Control X on a PC. So I'm copying it and cutting it. And I'm going to draw another text box out here anywhere, and I'm going to paste it in there. So I have the word ox isolated. What's the, what are some of the least important words here? It started with an. Which, which is the least important word? It, an with with is probably more important than an and it so sometimes i play a game called let's do our headlines as if some things are more important than others and let's play visual the visual hierarchy headline game so i will isolate these in their own text boxes so i'm going to hit command x i'm going to put the it in its own text box text box is too small there we go started i'm going to put it in its own text box Again, my text box is too small. Oops. And the and I'm going to put it in its own text box. And get rid of it here. Whoops. And the width will have its own text box, just not quite so big. So can I have some fun with this? I sure can. And with this new thing that you guys know about, which is that shift command or shift control click and drag thing we can really get this to uh, really come out really stand out hierarch hierarchical order so the it is less important so I am simply going to hold down the shift and command and click and drag it and make it smaller okay started not not uh, it, it's a pretty important word so I'm gonna leave it the same size you notice how I kind of found a nice little place to snug the word it in right around here let me hit the W key. There we go. With not as important as start, so I'm going to reduce it down in size, maybe put it somewhere around here. And is extremely insignificant, but I still have to read it. Let's see. We might put that kind of closer to the width. And I might offset these a little bit. Maybe I want to kind of have a visual path kind of stair stepping. And ox, the most important word. Done. Pay me. Guys, this is a secret to, one, a nice rhythm to typography, and two, enhancing the most important words. Just like that. I didn't labor over it, did I? Now, part of the reason why I didn't labor over it, I've been doing this for, I've been doing this for a few years. Many, many years. Now, it's not really finished yet. I really should look at this a little closer. Maybe I need to move the and around just a little bit. I might need to kern some things. Let's talk about kerning. Kerning is the fine-tune adjustment of spaces between two letter pairs. So I'm going to triple click on the word started. I'm going to go to the character panel, which is the backwards A. And this little V and diagonal um, forward slash and the A, this is the kerning area. Right now it's doing mathematical kerning. Now watch what happens when I do optical. It automatically adjusts the spacing between different letter pairs so that it is much better looking. Now I'm going to copy this and we'll compare the two. 
This is mathematical or metric kerning, and this is the kerning done by the computer. There's an awkward amount of space here as compared to here, and this seems a little wide in here. So what they've done with the optical uh, kerning is they've taken out a little space there, taken out a little bit of space there, um, made definitely some adjustment there, added some space there. Now, the optical kerning is not always accurate, but it's better than no kerning at all. Let's take the word ox. Now, I'm going to copy and paste him. Again, I'm just alt-dragging him to copy-paste. So the one in the headline, I'm actually going to select it, and I'm going to tell it to make it optical. And now you can see how it took out that little extra bit of space between the O and the X that was unnecessary and looked optically a little wide. Here it feels optically a little too wide. Here it feels much more comfortable. And then notice I move this over so that the X more or less, the visual path, if I were to draw an imaginary line, it would line up to the W to try to give it a little bit better flow. Okay. Now, there are certain letter pairs that are really much worse to deal with than others in regards to kerning. Whoops, let me copy this. Anything with an A or a V in it, especially capital letters, A, V, Y, are oftentimes in need of some severe kerning. Now, this, I believe, has already been kerned optically because I copied and, sp copied and pasted one that was already optically kerned. Uh-oh, am I going to lock up InDesign? Nope, good. Sometimes it does that, and it's going to act like it's going to lock up. Basically, I'm trying to hold down Shift and Command, and I was holding down Shift and Control. And on a Mac, you can't hold down Shift and Control because it's not a PC. Okay, so let me widen this out till I get the whole word. Oh, my. Let's make it all the same point size. There we go. So aviation is one of those words where we have a few issues in regards to kerning letters. Now this is already automatically kerned. Let me go back to metrics here. So we can see that between the A and the V it needs to be tightened up. So if you are doing this by yourself and not using optical, you can put your cursor in here and you can use the arrow in the kerning uh, numeric area and make that come down or up. So you can, with, this is how we had to do it before they had the optical kerning button available. We had to tighten them up ourselves until they looked good. So it was all about balance and uh, as if, and trying to not, trying to make it look like there's not so much white space between certain letter pairs. So this is my kerning. And then the computer kerning, well, here's metrics. This means it hasn't been kerned at all. And then this one is, we'll do this one. This one's the auto kern. Excuse me. Make sure that was the metrics. Oh, excuse me, that was optical. Even with optical, I sometimes kern it. This one will be metrics. But now, kerning is in the eye. It's kind of like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Kerning is sometimes the same thing. Some people may look at this and go, oh my gosh, the AV are too close together make them wider. But here you can see that that is way too much space. Now, I'm going to use a word that is being used currently in one of our uh, pieces. So, uh, and I'm going to use Garamond for just a second. Let's use Garamond, not bold. Even in lower case, we need to current sometimes. Do you see how much white space is between doing the A and the Y? And even between this Y and this A? And over here it looks a little tighter. This needs kerned. Oh, thank you. I spelled this wrong. There we go. But still, there's a little... Now, sometimes we'll get this stuff tight and touching. That's a little tough to deal with. And uh, there's a thing called... Um, oh, uh, oh, man, my typography head's not working. Oh, where letters touch and they create, it's called a ligature. Yes, ligature. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell this to do uh, auto, automatic uh, optical kerning. And wow, it took a lot of that space out of there. However, I may still go in here and make adjustments. Now when you do it so that letters touch each other, now that's pretty ugly. 
But if they're touching each other, that's basically what's called a ligature. However, that doesn't look very good, so I'm going to bring it back. So even though you guys might be using optical kerning, which is an automatic feature in InDesign, that doesn't mean that it still doesn't uh, need more adjusting. So you may have to do more adjusting even though you're doing optical, optical kerning. But start with optical first. It always sets it as, me, uh, as uh, uh, metrics, which is the mathematical kerning. That means mathematically between the set width of each character, there's the same amount of space. But what's happening here, the set width of this Y, you see how that, a, that D center drops down and almost is equal to that A? Well, it doesn't put any additional spacing there. It's already up there as far as it can go, as far as the set width of that character. So what we're just telling it to do is take up some of that space of the block that the A takes up. Because type was set in lead initially in these blocks. And so we'd have to, to kern, oftentimes we'd have to uh, uh, get a little file out and file away the lead to get it to come closer. So literally dealing with lead type. Okay? Kerning is very important. Start with um, optical and then go from there. And you saw how easy it was for me to deal with that headline. Now I can grab all of these and I could group them by going to object and group, which is command G or control G. And I can do the same trick of holding down shift and command and go, you know what, I really want this to be much larger. It didn't change the proportions of the letters uh, in, in relation to one another. They still look the same and all together and packaged. Okay? So if you do this and you want to play around with the size of your headline, uh, group those individual text boxes together and then hold down your shift and command or shift control and click and drag and make it bigger. If you wanted to rotate these, if you just float your cursor over one of the corner handles, you can click and drag and rotate it Oh, now we're talking, now we're talking some tension in the design. If you want to rotate the entire layout as if you were uh, a, a grid master like Kandinsky, Kandinsky was one of the guys in history that did a lot of grid work, did a lot of cool grid work. He'll take the whole layout after it's designed and he'll rotate it, everything in the layout, just enough to give it a little sense of tension. You're like, wow, that's so much more exciting than what you had just a second ago. Watch. Boring. Exciting. Theodore Kandinsky, the guy who kind of was the one who pioneered this. Okay? However, it starts with the grid straight up and you get everything put together, then you rotate it. What the hard part is, is if you start rotating things individually, like, oh, I'm going to rotate just the headline. And then you try to, and you're doing it by eye, and you're like, oh, that looks good. And then you try to rotate these the same percentage, and you're like, ah, I might have been off a little bit. And that, that's not good. You want to rotate them all at the same time. I'm hitting Command-Z to get them back, by the way. Okay, are we ready to talk about images now? Let's say we like where our type is. Let's lock that layer. Oops, turn it on, lock it. That way we don't accidentally put the image in the, the background image in, the, in that layer. Now I'm going to click on the background layer and I'm going to place an image. But before I do, let's see which image I'm going to place. I have my Project One folder. I have my images that I've collected from the uh, internet or from things I've taken. And I have this antique paper image that I'd like to put in the background. And I'm going to open it in Photoshop. And we talked about images uh, a previous class, and I have some videos about those. But I will uh, play around with this again. Now, this image is not 10 by 10 right now. Let me see what size I'm working with. I'm working at 15 inches by 12 inches, and I really need it to be more square shaped. So I'm going to do a sneaky, sneaky trick. I love the idea of having this kind of oxidized looking edge, this ancient look to it. But this is square format. So I'm like, darn it. I'm going to bring up my rulers, which is Command R. And let's see, this was image, image size, a little over, about 12 and a half inches by 15. So I'm going to go 12 and a half by 12 and a half. So I'm going to pull this over to 12 and a half. It tells me when I'm getting to it, 12.5 ish, close enough. 
And what I'm going to do is I want that edge, that smoky edge or oxidized edge to be right here. But this, it's all, it's all the way over to the left. Darn it. Ugh. There's one or two things I can do. I can steal from this edge because it's got more oxidation. This one's kind of thin over here. I can steal from it, flip it, mirror it, and put it over there. Now, I tend to like to not do that if I can because some people catch on to that. But let's sh let me show you how I might do that. Uh, this is an old trick, quick and dirty old trick. Let me fix my tools the way I like them, give it a second to think about whatever it's going to think about here. I don't know why it's thinking. I haven't done anything. Let's see if Photoshop just is acting goofy. Okay, it might be locked up. When I right click on the icon, it says force quick. Some, sometimes that means it's locked up. Okay, it got out. It, okay, it, it woke up. All right, what I do in this kind of case, I, I, when I'm kind of stealing stuff from my own image, and it's great for textures like this that, you know, you can't see faces or anything, there's no details, is I'll go ahead and feather this, maybe 50 pixels. You know, this is a 300 pixels per inch graphic, so that 50 pixel uh, feather is pretty good. I start grabbing outside what I need. Whoops. Grab all out to the corner. And then I'll do this kind of zigzaggy part in the middle because I really want that part to be feathered and kind of non-distinguishable. I don't want a straight line because people wouldn't be able to see what I did. So I'm going to copy this. Oops, let me duplicate the background. When the, or unlock the background, rather. Or duplicate it. Let's just duplicate it. There we go. So sometimes the background's locked. I can't unlock it for whatever reason, so I'll duplicate the background. So I'm going to copy this. Edit, copy. And I'm going to paste it. And then what it is, is it's in its own box here. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to drag it over, and then I'm going to flip it. Now, there's um, a thing called the transform tool. And you can sit here and tell it to uh, uh, rotate or flip or whatever. But I am just in too much of a hurry to have to go and do a drop down window. Here's free transform, command T. Okay, well, let's see what Command-T does. Command-T or Control-T. Okay, well, you can just click on these and grab them and flip them, move them, resize them, whatever. Uh, maybe I also want to flip it this way because I don't want people to see that I... It's kind of like mirroring it and flipping it upside down. There we go. And that looks pretty good. Oops, that's a little too high. All right, I'm done. If I have to, I might do something in there. There's something going on that I don't care for. So I might get my healing brush out and start, oops, I need to be on the right layer. Start playing around with that in there. It just feels like a little bumpy. But then when I like what I have, I'll go ahead and crop this to my roughly square area. Hit the return key, it's cropped now. And I'll go ahead and flatten it because I really don't need to do any additional work. Oh, and by the way, let's uh, turn off this layer for just a second. There's my feather right there. But yet, when you turn this on, you can't really see too badly at all where I did that. The uh, line of demarcation, so to speak. So it's like, oh, I just fooled you. Haha. -ha. This background came like this. I will flatten the image because I don't need it in multiple layers. I will make sure that it is in CMYK mode, which it is, and I will save it as a TIFF. I think I already had it as a TIFF. Okay, I saved it. We'll put it into images. I'm going to save it. Uh, I suggest not replacing stuff. Uh, I'm going to replace this. I'm living on the life of danger right now, so I don't have my old one to go to now. This is, this is saved right over it. So this is CMYK. It's not RGB. It's saved as a TIFF, and it's slightly bigger than 10 by 10, which is fine. Slightly smaller is a bad problem. Bigger is not, a little bit bigger is a good problem to have. Enormously bigger, that's a big problem too. So you want it kind of close. So I'm going to close this. And I'm going to go to InDesign. And I'm going to place it in the background. So make sure my background layer is selected. And I go to, and I'm going to hit the W key so I can see my bleed line, this red line. I want this to bleed off the edge because the color is going right to the edge. I want it to go a little beyond. 
So I'm going to go to File and Place, just like I would anything else. Go find my image. There it is. Open it. I'll have a loaded cursor. I put it up there in the corner. I click once. It's bigger than what I needed. I'm going to hit Command Minus, which would, on a PC would be Control. I hold down the magic keys, Shift and Command on a PC, Shift and Control. I click and drag on the corner node until I get it to that other bleed line and it resized it perfectly to that area. What will it look like when it prints? It's going to cut a little bit of that bleed off. It's going to look like that. I'm perfectly fine with that. Are you guys okay with this? Now the only problem is this is CMYK and we aren't doing four color process, are we? We're doing two colors. Darn, I almost forgot. I just put a four color piece of work in there. You're like, wait a minute, that's two colors. It's kind of like black and tan. Well, let's make it black and tan. This really isn't black and tan. It's black and a little bit of yellow and a little cyan, a little bit of magenta, all that stuff peppered in. So I'm going to I'm going to um, I'm going to share with you how to do a duotone. Now this is a perfect image for a duotone because it doesn't have all these different colors. I'm going to get rid of this uh, line that we don't need anymore. Okay, pay close attention to this. It's not difficult. Um, kind of hard to remember. It's not difficult to do though. First off, I'm going to have to change this image mode to grayscale. Yes, I said grayscale. Oh, but it was so pretty. I know it was. You got to strip all the colors out first. Secondly, I need to go to and make this mode, go to image and mode. I need to now make it a duotone. Before I did a grayscale, the duotone was grayed out. I couldn't do a duotone out of a CMYK image. A duotone is that, two tones. I click on duotone. Now, by default in the duotone options, it is, for some reason, it says monotone. That means it's black and white, and that's it. So you need to then choose duotone in the type. I need to check, I need to choose my second color. So right now it's white. I don't want my second color to be white. I click on that box. And I typically will use my color library, my Pantone, uh, usually process, or no, this would be solid in this case, solid coded for this, because process, again, is cyan, magenta, yellow, black. So Pantone solid, which is like the paint on the wall, it's not made of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black dots, it's a solid color. So coded just refers to the kind of paper we're printing to. That's not really important right now. And I go find this color that's maybe a reddish brown. So I'm looking for, and this is going to be my second color for not only this, but also if I'm going to use my reddish brown in my InDesign file for my text or something, this is my second color. So I need to write this color down when I decide it's something I like. Oh, that's too dark. So I've got to find something a little bit more reddish or orangish. I'm going to go with that and I'm going to lighten it. So right now, I'm using Pantone 1605C. I'm going to jot that down. You know, if I don't like it, I can change it because that's going to be my second color. And I need to remember that when I go to InDesign. Now, what I can do to make this a little bit more exciting, like it was before I changed it to a grayscale and then do tone, I can play with these levels right here. And I can allow this to have a little bit more of the brownish color in the midtones and a little less black in the midtones, and also highlights and shadows. So you can play around with this. Ooh, that ooh, that was bad. Go the other direction. If you don't like you what, well, what it's doing, go the other way. You know, just, I, this is about experimenting right now. I'm like, what? Do it till it looks good. Oh no, nope, that's too dark. Okay, and then I'm gonna go in here again. I'm gonna play around with this. Like I really want a lot more orange in some of this. Not so much there. Ooh, I'm liking that a little bit better. I'm like, okay, I like that. Now, it doesn't look like, oh, man, we got all these lights on. No wonder you guys can't see. Sorry about that. So now this is two colors. It's black and this orangish color. Now, if I just don't care for that, I can go back to image mode and do a tone. And I can go, okay, instead of that color, let's choose more of, um, let's try that color. I'm going to hit okay, and now it's more of a reddish color. I double click on it, and I can, again, play around with whatever these are going to, oh, this is looking really crappy. 
Ooh, cancel. I'm thinking more of a sandy, yellowy, reddish thingy. Let's do, uh, like, if I had the color cow's hide, that would be really good. Like a leathery, kind of yellowy, orangey, brownie. Okay, that's, that's nice one. Ooh, that looks good. Or this. Ooh, that looks really rich. Okay, that one right there. So now I'm going to write that one down. So you have to play around with it. 7563. 7563. Seven, okay, I'm going to do that one instead. So that looks pretty good. When you have what you like, hit OK. And then you can't save these as TIFFs. Remember the chart that I put on there a while ago where we have to do some things as EPS? Well, guess what? I forgot to write Duotone has to be an EPS. Because when you go to File, Save As, it will not allow you to save it as a TIFF. It doesn't even give it as an option. You want to save it as a Photoshop EPS. Okay, so duotones need to be saved as EPSs. So if you want to go find your notes from that day and write in the EPS thing, oh, duotones need to be EPSs. That's fine. So I save it, I hit OK, and that looks pretty rich. Now when I go to InDesign, that was my four color process one. If I go to links, links means, hey, it's something I'm linked up to. When you, anytime you go to file place, like an image, it's got to link up to that image. You have to keep those images with you. After you place images, don't throw them away. Because InDesign still needs to link up to them to print. So those are found in the links panel. And right now it's linked up to antique paper TIFF. I can relink that by clicking the relink tool. And this window will come up. And I go find my new one. So I go to images and I go find the EPS, which is right here. Open it and it's going through and it's linking it now to the EPS file. Looks slightly different. There we go. So I just placed an image into InDesign, making sure that that image is a duotone because I'm not allowed to use four color process on this. It's black and one other color, and that happens to be a Pantone spot color. And for me, it's 7563. So let me go to my swatches panel and see if 7563 came in. Oh my gosh, it sure did. As soon as I place that Photoshop file, InDesign is playing friends with him, and he's going, oh, you like that color? Well, me too. So I'll go ahead and put it in my swatches panel for you. Isn't that nice? saves you from having to make the color here in InDesign. Ah, thank you. Now I'm going to delete these colors that I'm not using because they're going to give me problems. So I'm going to click on one, hold down the shift key and click on all of them and hit the trash can. And I can use black and another color. What's registration? That looks like black. I think I'll use that for my black. Do not use registration. Registration is 100% cyan, 100% magenta, 100% yellow, and 100% black. And when it goes to print, that's 400% toner or ink coverage. And it will start picking, and, it, and it, it oftentimes jams on the printer, or it just kind of sticks, that toner sticks in the printer, and ends up on the next thing that you print. It's 400% ink coverage. And that's entirely way too much ink coverage. Well, you're like, why is registration even there? Let me see if I can throw it in the trash. You can't. Registration is for the crop marks, which would print on every printing plate, or what are called registration marks so they can register the colors on the plates. That's all that's for. And they're little tiny marks outside of the printable area. That's all that's for. It's really important to the printer, the guy who is the printer, the pressman. Okay, so I'm like, wow, this is looking pretty good, looking pretty ancient, right? Now, I may print it out and do a test print to see if the text is readable. If the text is not readable, then I have to make some more choices with that background. Now, I do have another image that I'd like to place in here. And it's this guy right here that I scanned from um, the books that I was showing when we talked about the dollar bill that day and everything's line art. I scanned this guy from one of those books. And um, he looks like this. <laughs> there he is. Remember him? Now I need to make sure he's right. His mode should be bitmap. Yay! 
gray it is. And his size, well, he's going to be pretty good size, 8 by 8, 1,200 pixels per inch, because he's a 1-bit graphic. So that doesn't take up lots of room if it's only a 1-bit graphic. And that's the kind of a cool-looking pattern, isn't it? That's like, wow, that's cool. Kind of zebra-like. Just a blow-up of, like, his stomach or something. So I'm going to close him. I don't need to do anything with him. I'm just going to close him. I'm actually going to close that one. Now I'm going to use him in InDesign. So let me bring up, in, oh, I keep open, wanting to open Illustrator. I love Illustrator, but I'm going to force quit him. Open InDesign. I'm going to place this guy. Now, again, I need to go to Layers. I'm going to lock my background layer, and I'm going to go to my Images layer because that's, Ox is an image. So I go to File and Place. Let me go find my Ox. I open him. I'll get a loaded cursor. Bam! Bitmap graphics come in with an invisible background. Sweet! Awesome. And if I go to my swatches panel, I can say, hmm, let me let me double let me get the oh, this little white arrow tool, the direct selection tool, he's really important when I'm dealing with bitmap bitmap graphics if I want to change their color. I click on the cow himself. And right here in the swatches panel, he says, hey, your cow is black. Well, what if I meant to make him Pantone 7563? Ooh, that's not very pretty. Let's make him, but, but cool. It's kind of cool. Let's make him black again. But let me back off his tint a little bit. Oh, now he's going gray. Mm, now let's make it 100%. Well, I want him to be opaque. Well, that's not in swatches. That's in effects. So I'm going to go to Window and bring up my Effects panel. Why didn't I just do it from up here? Because there's some effects up here. Because I, well, there's effects right there. But I want the whole, I want the full Monty. I want to be able to choose from anything here. So I can now back him off. He's no longer that ucky gray. He's blending in with the background. And if you want him to blend more, this blending mode here, which is oftentimes what we use in Photoshop, if I click there and do multiply, ooh, he just got richer. That means the browns and stuff underneath him are blending with the black, and it makes it much richer. That's not actually looking too bad, now is it? Maybe make him a little less opaque. Now again, you don't know what this is going to do until you print it because it looks great on the monitor and she lies to you all the time. She is, he or she says, oh, look how brilliant and wonderful this is. It's so beautiful. The colors are so saturated. Mm, delicious. Then you print it and you're like, oh my God, it went to mud. So that you do have to do a little test printing to make sure that we don't have to back up some colors. Okay, so I'm going to move him over just a smidge. Again, this is the black arrow tool now. And I might reduce, I don't know if I'll reduce him or not. I kind of like him. As long as he's not interfering with readability. Now, as far as the symbol goes, it's not in here yet. Like, oh no, where's my symbol? Now, I could find one and scan it in and whatever, but this is a pretty simple symbol to draw. Now, if you've never used the pen tool before, uh, it is not the easiest tool to get to know. Um, so I'm going to do a little drawing here. And I'm going to draw my own sort of wonky looking, uh, almost an archaic, uh, not so sharp, as if, you know, somebody was carving something in stone, um, Aleph uh, sign. Aleph or Aleph. So this started out looking like this. Oh, that's really bad looking, but if I took more time, it would look good. That's the melty Aleph. Now, cool thing is, is with this, if I have the white arrow tool, I can modify stuff. So if you guys, I will do a separate demo on the pen tool. It's, it's a whole other animal in itself. But I could draw this instead of having to go to Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever. I can do it right here. And I can group these, and I can, which is Command-G or uh, Control-G. And I can also adjust the opacity of this if I feel like it's a little much. Now, I'll probably take the strokes off of that, though. There we go. And then I might move this, if the symbol is not the primary element, and this is my display type as the primary element, I may move this. I may make this so insignificant that it's not even funny. I might even decide to make this an end of paragraph mark. 
do, 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 Look at me, so sneaky, I just didn't want to deal with him. But I meet the criteria of the assignment. Okay, done, pay me. What's next? Now, I have, I have to say there's still a few things that need work on here. This type, I would like to bring it down a little bit. Let me get the... Ooh, you guys want to know about an inline graphic? I think that um, Mark wants to know an in, about an inline graphic. Mark's going, why would you put it there like that? Let me, let me get to my images thing. Let me grab this. Oh, lock that because it keeps getting in the way. There we go. I'm going to move him out. What if this type gets rewrapped or something? Now I have to deal with that little image moving him around all the time. So let me show you what I mean by rewrapped. Oh, I come by and I say, hey, I think your columns are like too narrow. And you're like, great. So you're widening your columns a little bit, widen, widen. Oh no, he's not flowing with the rest of the text. Darn it. But if he were an inline graphic, he would. Oh, all these secrets I'm sharing with you today, I should get paid double for today's class. Let me lock the text layer so I can get that inline, that graphic, and I'm going to cut him. That means I copied him, and he's gone. Now watch what happens when I go back to the text layer. I'm going to unlock it. I put my cursor in after the word today. I'm going to put a space bar there, and I, and I hit Command V. Oh, there he is. Oh, but he's like up there. Well, that's okay. I'm going to highlight him, and here is a thing called baseline shift. It shows the little A is above the big A. The little A gets pushed up. Okay, I want to shift him down. Okay, that's good. Done. Maybe one more. Okay, there we go. Okay, pay me. Done. And now, when somebody says, oh, I want you to change all this up, Mark. And Mark's getting all nervous. He's like, oh, no, this is going to take a while. And this is going to move my little A-lift guy and whatever. And Mark does this. And A-lift goes with it. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that? Uh-huh. Yep. Pay me. Done. No problem. I love telling my editors and my art directors, no problem. And this is what makes it no problem. Because I have an inline graphic that moves with the text. Pay me. I can go home early and watch the movie and get dinner on top of it. Yes. You could, but as soon as, even if it were grouped, as soon as somebody says, hey, you know what, uh, let's edit this copy. I want to add, editors do this all the time, I want to add blah, 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 in there. You want him to flow with it automatically. If it's grouped, it won't flow with it automatically. It stays in the same position. No, let me, let me show you what I mean. It will only if it's an inline graphic. If this is not an inline graphic, let me get in here and get him out of here. Highlight him. X him out, command X that was, paste him, uh, let's see here, I need to actually get him, copy, get him to images, paste him, get rid of him, okay, if I put him in here, and I click on this, and I group it, okay, and then somebody goes, hey, add blah, 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 blah in there, he doesn't move with it, he's not an inline graphic when he's grouped, he's only an inline graphic, if you click on him, whoops, let me get this locked here. Click on him. Okay, I may have to hold the command key down to get to him. Where are you? Oh, he's grouped still. Let me ungroup it. That's why. I'm like, why isn't this working? It's because it's grouped. Let's ungroup it. Unlock that. Oh, I'm getting all excited now. Ungroup. Why aren't you ungrouping? There we go. Object ungroup. There we go. Got to isolate him. Turn that off. Just get on this layer. Boy, when you're on the wrong layer, it just makes your life crazy, doesn't it? Why is he not getting there? I probably am. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm too zoomed in. and I can't see the trees for the forest. Let me lock the ox. There we go. And then I can get this little guy, wherever he is. Let me find him. He's in here somewhere. Is he locked? Okay, I'm just going to unlock everything. Let's just move over. There he is. If you can't, I'm trying to go through the layers too. If you have all your layers unlocked and you know something's underneath another thing, like if I try to click on him right now, I'm like, I can't get to you. I'm clicking. Hold down command on a PC. This would be control. Command and click. It'll go to the next thing under it. So there we go. So I'm going to, I'm going to 
get him out of there. I just X'd him. Let me lock the text layer. The background layer is locked. And ox is locked, but the images is not. There we go. I'm going to paste it in here. By the way, you can leave him in there and turn him off, too. You're like, hey, you know what? I don't need you right now. I'll save you for later. Okay. So let's walk through this one more time of inline graphic. Okay, so I'm going to take him. I'm going to copy him. Then I'll turn him off, okay? There we go. I'll go to the text layer, unlock it, click where I want him to go, which is, you can see the cursor wanting to say, put something there, my cursor is ready. I usually hit the space bar just to get a little space between the period and the ending graphic, and I'm going to paste him in there. I highlight him, do the baseline sh shift going down, and if he is too big, you can click on him with the black arrow tool and you can still resize him. Now, when you resize them, you may have to work with the baseline shift the other way. Okay, there we go. Inline graphic. So what actually makes it the graphic when you go up there? And, uh... What made it the graphic was when I drew it in the first place. Okay. So this right here, let me hide the text for just a minute. Um, the text layer. In the images layer, I drew this guy right here with the pen tool. Let me make him really large so we can see him. I drew him with a pen tool and he in essence is a graphic. Whether it's a Photoshop thing or something I drew here or an Illustrator thing, you can make anything an inline graphic. Handy! Very handy. Now most of you guys won't be using inline graphics, but I know a couple of you who are talking about using it as an ending mark to the paragraph or using graphics within your body copy. So I wanted to share that with you. Okay. It's, all, it's only four minutes till the end of class. So I think it'd be, it, it's safe to say that I need to be done, don't you think? Um, so uh, again, I might finesse this text a little bit, get it under his belly, uh, work maybe work the ox a little bit, maybe reduce him down in size just so I can kind of deal with this text. You know, I'm not looking at the grid right now, but I really need to. I'm breaking the grid. But, um, you know, he's giving me some fits as far as the body copy goes. So I need to work that out visually. Oh, if I want to wrap it around his leg? Awesome suggestion. That's lots of fun. So let's say I wanted to do a text wrap. Yes, I did have that written down to take and, and learn that. Um... Now, he's not in the best place position, so let me widen this text, and we'll do it with that text here. I'll really widen that. If you wanted the text to wrap around kind of the edge of this leg and the edge of this leg, one, I will draw it so the text, make, the, make it so it's wider than uh, what it needs to be, and it runs into all the places I want it to run into. Now, I need to choose the ox himself, that image. Okay, so I choose it with the black arrow tool or whatever. Make sure it's unlocked. And this is called a text wrap. So I'm going to wrap the text around the edges of his legs. And right there, it might give me a problem, but I'm all right with that. I'll fix it. So this is found in the text wrap panel, which is found under window text wrap. And you get a text wrap panel that pops up. You want to wrap not, this is no text wrap here. This is wrap around the box, which is the shape that the cow is in, which is, we don't want that. We want it to wrap around the edges or the shape of the ox. Now, right now it's not detecting the edges, and you can see my text is going outside the box. It's gone. And my headline's gone too because it's, it's affecting the headline. So I'll deal with that in just a second. I want it to actually detect the edges. So where it says contour options, Tell it, hey, please detect the edges. Oh, look, it's got a little pink line around my little cow. It just found the edges. Oh, my gosh, look, the type is wrapping around it. Smashing. However, the type is touching the edge of the cow, and that is not good. We want at least a one pica uh, width between the edge of a graphic and the type. So, oh, look right here. I wonder if that's what that's about. Let me type in 1P. Done. Now, we do have a problem. 
There must have been one tiny pixel right there that I don't see. Darn. I can use my white arrow tool, which is known as the direct selection tool, and I can click on that node and delete it. Whoa. Stop. Should have just deleted that one. Delete. Ooh. We don't like that. Let me see if I can even move that. Usually if I delete one of those, it does fine. Maybe I'll use a different tool for that. Boy, I'm running into a little hiccup right now. Hmm, I'm just going to move this up. I'm going to like, get out of here, you. It does. If I delete, it deletes the whole cow. So I'm moving all of these points up. It looks kind of wonky, but I'm going to get out of here. Move it. You're not wanted. I'm moving that weird little thing that was there. I'm just moving every anchor point until it gets up all, all up in there. Same thing with his, you know, where he goes to the restroom. I'm going to go, hey, you know what? I really don't want to wrap around your PP, so let's just take it right on up here. Sorry, that's what it is. So I'm moving these because I don't really want that dangling down. Woo, and this is with the white arrow tool, direct selection tool. Uh-oh, I just moved the text. Ding, that's why we should lock it. Get back on this guy. Move that, move that. There's a lot of little anchor points I gotta move, but ah, uh, we're getting better. I might even move that up even more. Hey, up there, please. Move. Move, please. Yeah, that's the ticket. Get up there. Yeah, ah, uh, perfect. And then I might have to just move the text down just a little bit. Unlock that, grab the text, and go get away from that thing. It's dirty anyway. There we go. How awesome was that? Gosh, class is over. There's so much more I wanna show you. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording, and, I, and all that was on recording, wasn't it? <laughs> Do not share this with your parents or your children.